Good evening, and welcome to the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine's second COVID-19 National Grand Rounds. I'm Dr. Ian Martin, president of SAEM. For those of you joining us for the first time, SAM is the premier international organization representing researchers and educators in emergency medicine. In our work, SAM promotes and facilitates scientific discovery, educational innovation, and the professional and leadership development of our members. Tonight, we're proud to bring to you a COVID-19 presentation entitled, From Katrina to COVID-19, Emergency Care for the Underserved During Times of Crisis. During this presentation and during our questions and answers session, you will hear from six emergency medicine faculty members hailing from the Department of Emergency Medicine at Louisiana State University School of Medicine in New Orleans. Our presenters will share their experiences battling the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly as it pertains to the associated health disparities. As many are seeing now, natural disasters like Hurricane Katrina and now the coronavirus pandemic serve to exacerbate and highlight pre-existing health disparities. As was the case during our first COVID-19 National Grand Rounds, I'm sure our colleagues from LSU will provide along the way guidance and insight that will prove invaluable to the rest of us as we care for patients in our own communities. During the presentation, you may submit questions for the presenters by clicking the Q&A button in your Zoom menu interface. Questions that are upvoted will be prioritized during our questions and answer session to start immediately after our presenters have concluded. So to kick things off, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lisa Moreno-Walton. Dr. Moreno is Professor, Director of Research, and Director of Diversity in the LSU New Orleans Department of Emergency Medicine. Dr. Moreno is also President-Elect of the American Academy of Emergency Medicine. Her academic accomplishments include over 500 academic presentations, 45 publications, six book chapters, two textbooks, and numerous awards. Dr. Moreno's research interests include healthcare disparities, violence prevention and treatment, and viral diseases. Across her career, she has worked to eliminate health disparities for women, underrepresented minorities, and the under-resourced. So welcome, Dr. Moreno, and thank you for being here. Dr. Moreno, would you briefly describe for us what it's been like to care for patients in Louisiana since this pandemic began? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Martin, for the opportunity to speak with all of you tonight. It's an honor to be here sharing our experiences. New Orleans is a really unique place to live and work. We're a small city, but we have all the big city problems. We're also a destination city but we have none of the tax base and none of the employment base that other destination cities have, such as the music and movie industry in Los Angeles, Orlando's Disney, New York's financial center, and the casino industry in Las Vegas. Unlike other destination cities, we lack a developed mass transit system in a city where actually one in five families is without a car. And we're highly dependent on the tourist industry, which makes events like Katrina and COVID potentially catastrophic for the city of New Orleans. But what averts catastrophe in these kinds of situations is that we have a highly resilient black population, a highly educated Caucasian population and highly skilled Hispanic and Asian populations in an environment where the class system is less conspicuous and the inter SES class slash education slash race cooperation is a whole lot more conspicuous than it is in other large cities and destination cities. So while we have disparities and we do, there's no doubt about that, but we also have a level of collaboration around supporting people when and where they need it. And this is one of the things that makes New Orleans unique and has impacted our ability to recover from Katrina and respond to COVID. Truly unprecedented times indeed, thank you. I now want to introduce the rest of our speakers for this evening. Dr. Jennifer Vegno, Director of the Health Department for the City of New Orleans. Dr. David Barron, Medical Director of the Emergency Department at University Medical Center in New Orleans. Dr. Peter W. Chief Experience Officer at University Medical Center in New Orleans. Dr. Jeff Elder, Co-Director of the Division of EMS and Disaster Medicine 
And finally, Dr. Scott Mackey, Chief Medical Informatics Officer at University Medical Center in New Orleans. So welcome to you all and thank you for joining us tonight. For the audience, our speakers will also be answering questions online throughout the presentation. So Dr. Moreno, I'll now turn this over to you. Okay, thank you. So during the next 45 minutes, we are gonna cover hospital level pandemic preparation, systems emergency management, disparities in COVID-19 infections and outcomes, patient and family experience during the pandemic, preparing for special populations, and finally, EPIC and discharge testing. So I'm now going to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Dr. David Barron. Uh, thank you, Drs. Moreno and Martin, and thank you to SAEM for hosting tonight's presentation. Uh, let's get started. So I am uh, the medical director of the emergency department at UMC in New Orleans. I'm also an LSU emergency medicine physician. Um, just to give you some sense of the context of our emergency department that we're working in, we are a level one trauma center. We're an independent academic medical center. We affiliate with both LSU and Tulane. We're home to LSU emergency medicine. Uh, we see about 90,000 patients a year. We admit around 17% usually. Uh, we've got 50 main beds, uh, 104 hours of attending level coverage and 48 hours of NP and PA coverage daily. We have every service available to us um, at the trauma center with the exception of OB and pediatrics. So we have a pretty robust uh, list of resources to begin with when we began um, addressing the pandemic. This shows you a basic layout of our emergency department. So when this pandemic began, we were only seeing a couple of patients a day. Our flow through the ED went through the main entrance and the ambulance entrance and then stopped in triage four, where patients had a PPE placed on the, the masks, and then they were moved into the negative pressure rooms. Um, as those numbers of patients have become increasingly robust, um, we had a tent initially to help as sort of a split flow system. And then those patients dropped back off. We closed the tent in April, uh, April 19th, and we now have a flow for the patients that goes directly into the main entrance or ambulance entrance. They go into the waiting room, they're cohorted in the waiting room. So patients that are suspected for COVID are kept separately from patients that are not suspected to have COVID. Um, but the volumes in our emergency department have been so low that we rarely have a waiting scenario in the waiting room at all at this point. They go through triage, PPE is placed. If they're low enough acuity, they're going into the fast track beds. And if they are COVID and low acuity, they're going into a certain fast track area that's cohorted just for those patients and just for testing those patients. If they are sick enough to need to go into the main pod beds or resuscitation beds, um, they are kind of the first question that's being asked from triage is, are we predicting that they're going to need some kind of aerosol generating procedure? Are they gonna to need to be um, intubated? Are they gonna to need to be on CPAP, BiPAP? Are they gonna to need to be given NEBS? If so, they're going directly to these negative pressure rooms that you see in the front of pod one. Um, and if they need to be intubated, they can move back out. Otherwise they're going to the, to the main pod beds. Again, attempting to cohort those patients um, in the front of pod one if possible, kind of depending on the, on the um, incidents that we're seeing that, that day. So that's the system we've had in place since April 19th um, that we're continuing to use. This graph shows you the impact on our volume that a forced isolation order has had. So on the left side of the screen, you see our normal daily volume, which is about 250 patients a day. The greenish line represents our admit rate. So that's normally around 17%. Forced isolation order occurred on March 24th. And you see within two days, our volume dropped. And we're seeing about 140, 150 patients a day. Our admit rate went up to about 25%. So volume has dropped, acuity goes up. Um, but the actual overall number of beds that we are requesting from the ED every day has actually trended down, not significantly, but that's the red line, the red columns you're seeing on the bottom of the screen are the actual number of patients we're needing on the inpatient side. So um, even though the number has gone down a little bit, the demand on every patient or the amount of complexity for every patient has gone up because they're still being cohorted on the inpatient side where co COVID patients are being kept separate from non-COVID patients, which has different implications for PPE 
and nursing staff. So volume went down a little bit there on the inpatient side, but we're still um, seeing a lot of uh, complexity per patient that's going and being admitted. This shows you our ICU admissions every day. So the, the blue bars in the back show our overall admits. The green line shows the percentage of patients that are going to the ICU of those admits. So a little bit of an increase there as well. So we're seeing um, about the same number of overall bed demands, but a slightly increased number of patients that are going to the ICU on a daily basis. This is showing you our testing in the ED. So just to kind of give you a sense of, of we're doing on an average of about 45 tests a day with a range of about zero to 111. And that's, you can see the peak there was um, around March 19th, I'm sorry, yeah, March 19th, March 20th. So overall um, number of tests, 2,300. Of the people that were tested, 35% were admitted. And of the people that were tested, about 7% went to the ICU. This kind of gives you a sense of what that demand was. Um, this is all tests ever coming out of the emergency department. If they were ever done by the state or by any other testing facility, this is all tests are included here. Just to give you a sense of that demand. And this shows you the percentage of patients who were tested who got admitted. So to me, the interesting thing here is um, when we initially began testing people and those tests were being determined by the state when people could be um, tested and when they couldn't, you see that almost everybody who tested was admitted. 100% of those patients were admitted. As testing became more liberal and the EDs were doing their own testing, we had our own commercial testing sites where we're doing it in-house, the rate dropped down into the 20th percent range. And this just kind of gives you a sense of what happens when you change the testing indications in terms of the acuity that you see for the that patient population. And this slide is showing you all of the interventions that have been made in our ED. So our, our first COVID positive patient was on March 10th. Um, you see the staffing changes began on March 11th. So that was, it took one day for one of our faculty to, to be home on quarantine. Um, and so ever since that point, it's been constantly um, taking those people who are quarantined or isolated and giving them jobs in telemedicine or telehealth from home if they're able to do it. Um, it's been always staffing by volume. So as our volume dropped, pulling people out, we've been closing down some of the pods that you saw earlier, reassigning those providers to new roles, um, just being very, very flexible with what we need from our providers as our volume changes and as our acuity changes. You see um, a homeless shelter on the top there in green, and you also see a convention center in green on the right-hand side of the screen. Those are essentially disposition options from the emergency department. So patients who don't need to be admitted because they're not sick enough, but they can't go home. Either they're, they don't have a home and it's not safe for them, or they just need to be OBS and don't need to come inpatient. Those are options that the ED has been using to sort of decant um, those patients out of the ED into safe locations. The light blue there that says incident command meetings, um, those are meetings we were having twice daily with directors around the hospital led by um, upper administration that served as sort of our, our single point of truth uh, for the emergency department group. So we're sending out documentation from those meetings twice daily when we are having them twice daily and they've since decreased in frequency, but letting people know what's going on in other people's departments. How many events do we actually have? How many ICU beds do we actually have? And a lot of that is to help people understand um, the, a lot of the anxiety could be quelled. A lot of the questions about resource allocation could be quelled because of the information that came out of those meetings and our documentation of that out to the group. We began telemedicine on the 19th. So COVID hotline began on March 19th using some of the faculty who are home on quarantine. And um, we expanded that to include um, telehealth and teletriage functions in the emergency department. Um, you see the tent there that's kind of in that beige color that was open for a month and closed essentially because the volume wasn't there to support the staffing. That was essentially a split flow model, COVID, non-COVID, and it helped us to shunt those patients into the right care areas while keeping some of them out of the hospital. The blue sur med surgeon ICU protocols were admission um, protocols to give us an insight of where patients should go and what kind of monitoring they should need from the emergency department. So we helped with some of that flow as the patients went in. And then you see system leveling. So of, of the adult hospitals in our system, we have the most capacity, we have the most resources, we have the most inpatient beds available. So we developed processes and protocols for those to help decant 
some of the other adult hospitals in our system so that they wouldn't have congestion or boarding in their ICUs or in their EDs. We would take those patients with our capacity and help those other sister hospitals keep the flow of their patients moving. So those give you a sense of the timeline um, and all the interventions that the ED has made from about March 1st um, until, until the 20th of this month. Um, so I'd like to hand it off to Jeff Elder who's gonna go into some more detail about the system emergency management. Good evening, thanks for having me and thanks to SAEM. Um, you know, I'd like to start with some of the hospital emergency management. So I have a role as the medical director for emergency management for the hospital. And so, you know, like many hospitals, our pandemic planning uh, had been going on for years prior to this. Uh, really a lot came from H1N1 and we kind of kept those plans over the years with kind of intermittently looking at them. Um, you know, obviously when this all really kind of ramped up in early January, when the news report started from China, we uh, began to kind of look at our plan uh, and come up with a process for how we were gonna deal with uh, a possible patient under investigation. And so as part of that, we came up with an emergency department plan um, to evaluate these patients. And so if you remember at the time, uh, this really had to do with um, uh, travel plus symptoms, right? So patients had to have fever, cough, maybe shortness of breath, plus they had to have traveled from an area uh, with uh, the virus. And so we had that process uh, worked out. And then on January 26th, uh, we had our first call from a clinic. A patient had uh, been on a cruise uh, in, throughout much of Asia, uh, including Hong Kong and some other stops uh, that she had flown home. And then within a day or two of being home, uh, she ended up having uh, cough, congestion, kind of URI type symptoms. And so luckily we received a call from her uh, primary care physician um, who asked, uh, uh, who asked her to come into the hospital and then the physician called us uh, to give us a heads up. And so that was our initial evaluation. Now, luckily that patient uh, ended up uh, being negative, uh, but it really started our process. And part of that process was that at the time for testing, it required a call to the state of Louisiana. There was no in-house testing then. And so we would have to get on the phone, talk to uh, an epidemiologist at the state who would then approve the testing and the test would be sent to the state for, uh, to, to run. And so, uh, you know, after we dealt with this first patient, we really kind of upped some of our, our planning and we started this SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus two specific work group. And this group uh, had uh, many different players. We met multiple times a week. It was the CMO, infectious disease, emergency management, the ED, critical care, hospitalists. And we all kind of were sitting around look, talking about what would our processes need to be uh, when we ultimately had a positive patient. And so next we'll look at kind of a timeline of what this looked like with emergency management and some of the duties that we, we, we performed during this, during this event. And so if you look, we we're kind of lucky that we had a big gap. So on the 26th of January, we had that first patient and then we had a large gap until the 10th of March. And that really gave us some time to prepare to have some processes in place when we had our first positive. And so the New Orleans area had our first positive on the 9th at a different hospital. Uh, and on the 10th, we had our first positive at two of our, our hospitals in our system, including university. And so that's when really kind of everything else that you can see here ramped up. And so, um, you know, this, uh, this really triggered our uh, quite a large surge and increase in our patients under investigation and those that we were testing. So really once the 10th hit, our patient numbers for uh, COVID PUIs really jumped up. And so next I wanna look at kind of the system-wide incident command. So what I've been talking about so far has been a university medical center. And we're part of a five hospital system, uh, including a, a children's hospital, three community hospitals, um, and, in, and university is the academic trauma center for the system. And so on the 10th, when we had this first patient, we began the process of standing up hospital system incident command. And so we stood it up at the system level as well as the hospital level. So that way we had command and control and accountability throughout the system and at all of the system hospitals on how we would handle this incident. So when we talk about incident command, you know, first we have our teams, right? So that's the senior leadership at the system as well as all of the uh, hospitals. Um, that those are people like the CEO, the CMO, um, department heads, um, and, and really just placing people in the right incident command spots. Um, one of the first things we had to deal with was testing. So initially, as I discussed, the Office of Public Health was the only lab that was able to perform COVID testing. 
Um, that was uh, difficult at times because we had a significant turnaround for our tests. And that was you know, from two to three to four days. We also had to work on some processes to increase the flow of tests from the hospitals to the state lab when our volume was surging amongst other hospitals in our region. Next up came commercial testing. And when that became available, uh, to be honest, it really wasn't helpful initially. Um, once that started up, we had seven to 10 day turnaround on tests. So it really was not practical either for outpatients or for inpatients. And when you talk about PPE burn, uh, that becomes a significant issue with those testing delays. And so finally on April 10th, we were able to start in-house testing with multiple different platforms, uh, Abbott, Cepheid and Roche here at University Medical Center and amongst our other sister facilities. And so one of the things that happened when the uh, state really declared an emergency was that the State Department of Health ceased all ambulatory and non-emergent surgical procedures and really stopped all non-emergent healthcare uh, across the state. And so what that allowed us to do is open up inpatient beds for our hospitals. Of course, that was the big scare, was at what point were we going to exceed our capacity at the hospitals? And that's something that we worked on from the beginning. And so some of that was the clinical workflows. And you know, um, that whether that be the ED, the inpatient uh, hospitalist teams, uh, the ICUs, it really took a little while for the clinicians to get more comfortable with caring for these patients. Um, you know, we didn't know exactly what worked and what didn't work. And in the end, you know, it really was a lot of good evidence-based medicine and good supportive care uh, that pushed this through. You know, one important thing to say is that our hospitalist teams, while our total number of uh, patients in the hospital went down, the acuity of our COVID patients and the number of COVID patients continued to rise until about April 1st, where we had our peak. Um, and so for our hospitalist teams, they had almost all of the patients in the hospital. And so we were capping those teams, we were adding teams left and right um, to have more capacity to take care of these critically ill patients, uh, including the ICUs. And that's where the facilities come into play. We were able to add 75 uh, ICU beds across the system, including an entire 24 bed wing here at University Medical Center that was created into negative pressure. Additionally, we used our trauma and medical ICUs as well as the um, PACU for uh, ICU level care. And we used our PACU for the non COVID patients uh, to have some additional capacity for the ICUs. So as I said, our census really peaked around April 1st with around 400 COVID positive patients. Luckily, we've kind of gone down uh, to about 200 today. Um, and our vent use has decreased and our ICU uh, uh, use has, uh, has also decreased with our census. Um, you know, obviously like everyone else, PPE conservation was something that we've dealt with uh, this entire time from the beginning. It's something that we talked about. Um, and I think the fact that we had a system uh, and, and, and we weren't a hospital alone by ourselves really helped us. That allowed us to have much greater purchasing power. And we had some really good logistics and supply folks that helped to uh, get us the things that we needed uh, throughout this time. So the next thing I'd like to look at is uh, the convention center. I know David talked about this a little bit. And so our convention center here in New Orleans is huge. Um, we were worried in March that we would quickly um, saturate our hospitals and we needed a way to kind of, uh, uh, you know, open up the back door and let the lower level inpatients uh, go to another facility where they could be cared for. And a lot of these patients were patients that would have typically gone back to a nursing home but couldn't because of COVID or maybe had some ambulatory issue or required something like a, a low level uh, supplemental oxygen that we couldn't get set up at, at someone's home. And so this was a thousand bed facility set up by uh, the feds and the state of Louisiana Department of Health uh, to care for these discharges. Uh, luckily, our numbers didn't get that, that high. Uh, they have about 500 beds there and at, at, at their maximum, there were a little over a hundred patients there. Um, what I will say here is you know, the medical director for this medical monitoring station is one of our emergency medicine uh, attendings, Megan Meslenka. She's disaster medicine fellowship trained. And it, it really, uh, uh, it, it's really important that as, a, as an emergency medicine group in our community, whether you're a small group in a rural area or a large academic center like us in a city, um, you know, some of our faculty members are embedded into uh, what's going on out there. And so that really helped us 
uh, kind of push flow and care for our patients, not only in the hospital, but in the community, whether it be, you know, uh, Dr. Avegno, who's with the city health department, Dr. Cantor, who's with the state health department, Dr. Maslenka with her disaster medicine uh, uh, background, you know, working at the medical monitoring station, or Dr. Mackey with IT, um, we had uh, our physicians kind of embedded in what was going on in the community. And so moving forward, uh, you know, now that our numbers are, are, have plateaued and they're starting to come down, it's, you know, what do we do next? And so luckily our uh, testing abilities have greatly increased over the past few weeks. That has allowed us to look at some of the um, healthcare disparity in our, um, in our city, uh, in our region, that um, we're noticing with some of our testing. So areas of the city that really were hit hard um, that Dr. Moreno is gonna speak about in a little bit as well as Dr. Avegno. And we were able to go out into the community starting last week and really hit those areas with testing. And so we were in our first location last week, we're in another location now on the other side of the Mississippi River this week, and we'll move back to the East Bank next week and go on for the next few weeks. And in partnership with LCMC Health and New Orleans Health Department, as well as LSU Health Sciences Center, we're able to expand some of that community testing uh, in our neighborhoods. You know, additionally, we're looking at things like bringing back uh, elective and non-emergent uh, procedures. And so our hospitals are starting to ramp up for that. Um, and we're just planning for those uh, additional surgical cases so we can get back to the routine business of healthcare. These are things that have been put off now for months for patients. Uh, and we wanna get them back in. So if, whether they need a biopsy or major surgery, we can now start to do that for our patients. Um, and then ultimately, you know, it's still planning for what's to come. So as the state of Louisiana opens back up in the next two weeks, you know, we expect that we'll see more cases and we really have to stay on top of these numbers so we do not overwhelm our hospitals a second time. And so that's where we're at now and just kind of uh, in a steady state, uh, increasing some of that non-emergent care, but also looking forward to what we're gonna have to do over the next couple of weeks to months as the economy starts to open up and people start to move around. And so uh, next up, I'd like to hand it off to Dr. Lisa Moreno. Um, and I uh, thank SAM for uh, having me tonight. Thank you. So I'm gonna speak to you a little bit about disparities in COVID-19 infections and outcomes. So let's take a look at um, the demographics of um, that we look at when we do research of any kind. So what you wanna see when you look at the demographics of any cohort and you're concerned about disparities is you wanna see that the demographics of that cohort match the demographics of the disease that you're looking at. So in a given situation, if there are no disparities, you wanna see that, for example, the population of whites living in the United States is equal to the population of whites who contract COVID. The population of blacks living in the United States is equal to the population of blacks who contract COVID. And you also wanna see that with outcomes. You wanna see the same thing. The percentages should match exactly for death. But we know that this actually isn't the case. So anybody, even people who don't work in the areas of, of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion are well aware that there are healthcare disparities that exist in the United States. And so since we know that there are um, healthcare disparities that exist in the United States, we're not surprised when we see demographics like this. And in New Orleans, we have a majority, rather a minority, um, majority population. So the majority of our patients actually are minorities. Our population is about 69% Black and uh, Hispanics about 14 to 16%, depending on whether you're including the entire parish or just the city. So you automatically look at our demographics as compared to the United States. And most people are going to assume that we actually are going to have some, some worse outcomes because of the fact that we have more minorities living in our city. So the next slide um, looks at the actual COVID statistics. So we're looking at a national population of 328 million individuals 
um, and a Louisiana population because I was not able to get um, state sensitive data on, I'm sorry, uh, city sensitive data on this, but our population of the state is 4.649 million. So if you look at the number of people tested, and these statistics were taken from Saturday's data. So the people tested in the United States was five and a half million individuals, which was 1.65% of the population, 30% positives, and a 5.6% death rate, which as you know, from a standpoint of medicine is an unacceptable death rate. We don't like anything over uh, 2%. So when you look at our state, we actually tested 2.92% of the population. And as Dr. Avegno pointed out, when we talked earlier today, we tested not only more than any other place in the United States, but we actually tested more than any other um, country tested. So, this, so the city of New Orleans actually tested more patients than any other country tested, let alone that the United States tested. Our positivity rate was actually lower than that in the United States. And that may be possibly the effect of having tested more people and, and tested more broadly. But unfortunately, our death rate was higher than that in the United States. So we were testing more according to what epidemiologic evidence would say we should test, but our death rate was actually much higher. Our death rate may be a little higher because as of Saturday, we had presumed deaths due to COVID um, 43 individuals whose tests had not come back. So we didn't know that. So again, because of the demographics of being a city of uh, minority individuals, our death rate was actually higher than the rest of the US uh, population. Next slide. Okay. So our, the way that our demographics, I'm sorry, can you go back to the previous slide? the one that showed death rates for multiple cities. Okay, so our demographics actually were not, of, of having an increased death rate was not specifically due to having an increased minority population, but essentially was seen in minorities throughout the United States. So in the state of Louisiana, where you have approximately 31% African-Americans, the death rate of African-Americans was 70%. In the state of Chicago, I'm sorry, the city of Chicago, where you have 30% of the population as African American, the death rate from COVID among African Americans was also 70%. And in the city of Milwaukee, where you have 26% of the population that is African American, 82% of the deaths were among Blacks. And so clearly, clearly, there is a disparity and the disparity is definitely racially based. And the next slide, we're gonna look at some of the comorbidities that were impacted and associated with COVID death in Louisiana. So for our state, actually a full 97% of the individuals who succumbed to COVID were uh, also suffering from one or more of these comorbidities. And the most commonly seen one was hypertension. 66% of the individuals who died of COVID in the state of Louisiana had hypertension. And the second most frequently seen was diabetes, which was 46%. But we also had a significant number of people who had cardiovascular disease, that was 23%. Chronic kidney disease, which was 25%. Obesity, which was also seen in 25% of our population, and cancer, which was seen in 11%. The next slide is going to look at how this was associated um, with, with race. And so the green bars that you're looking at are showing the level of association between COVID comorbidity and death. So again, you see what I, what I pointed out before that 66% of the patients who died had a comorbidity of hypertension, 44% had diabetes, 25% obesity, and 11% cancer. And then you look at the red bars to see how these comorbidities were actually present in the black population. So the prevalence of these diseases in the black population is represented by the red bars. And the prevalence of these diseases in the white population is represented in the blue bars. And you see that there's a significant difference, which is statistically significant 
in the prevalence of diseases that function as comorbidities with a positive association with death from COVID, these are seen more frequently in the black population than in the white population of Louisiana. So clearly having certain comorbidities makes it increasingly likely or increases the odds that an individual is going to die from COVID. And these comorbidities were increasingly seen in the black population. On the next slide, um, we are gonna look at those that live below the federal poverty level. So one of the other things that definitely plays a part in health is one's income. So this is something that's again known, not just to people who work in the areas of disparities, but pretty much all physicians are aware that income level is impacted um, or has an impact on one's health and the likelihood of dying from many diseases that are tracked. The interesting thing about Louisiana, even though we have a majority minority population and a tremendous number of um, African Americans is that our poverty level is significant for every race represented. And so when you look at income and poverty in the United States, where only 8.1% of white individuals are living below the poverty level, I used New York City as kind of an intermediary inter, uh, reference point, but in Louisiana, 12.7% of whites live below the federal poverty level. So this is a 50% increase over the rest of the country. The increase among blacks is also very significant, a 50% increase over the rest of the country. In Hispanics, it is less pronounced, but nonetheless, it is pronounced. And so poverty in the state of Louisiana is de definitely predisposes individuals to a higher death rate. And yet ironically, we saw most of the deaths among blacks. In the next slide, I'm also looking at educational disparities. Educational disparities are also significant and are known to have a correlation with increased morbidity, uh, for multiple diseases. So interestingly enough, there is a significant difference here, even though whites living below the poverty level um, in the United States is 50%, excuse me, in Louisiana is 50% higher than in the United States. What you do see is that the population of whites are significantly more educated in the city of New Orleans than in the general population. And this is like a two thirds increase in education. You also see that the Asian and Hispanic population is significantly more educated um, in New Orleans than in the United States. The Hispanic uh, population is 10 percentage points higher almost. And the Asian population is um, about eight percentage points higher. But if you look at the black population, there is again, a tremendously significant uh, difference in the disparities related to education. So the black population that is college educated is less than 20% in the United States, in New Orleans rather, and more than a third in the United States as a whole. So education disparities, again, go highly against the black population. And we know that, as I pointed out earlier, both educational disparities and underlying illness have a strong correlation to morbidity and mortality. On the next slide, I'm looking at another incident that another area that is important. And um, there should have been a slide about nutrition. Uh, that may be next, I'm sorry. So information disparities are also pretty significant. Up to 33% of all New Orleans homes lack internet services, which is pretty shocking. That's like one in three homes in the city of New Orleans lack internet services. And 21% or almost one in four individuals in a city do not own a computer. So this creates a situation where individuals might be receiving information from television only, um, and they are not able to collaborate that data on the internet or to see some of the follow-up that actually comes out on the web that may contraindicate some of the things that came out on live 
uh, television reporting. Now, one of the questions that comes up, everyone says, oh, everybody has a cell phone, including homeless people. Don't people in New Orleans have cell phones? Then the answer is yes, people in New Orleans do have cell phones. But one of the things that happens is that due to poverty, a lot of these cell phones do not have um, a lot of data available. And so they cannot be constantly checking to find out whether there's information or misinformation coming off the television. And they're not getting constant feeds that most of us get on our, tele uh, on our uh, cell phones that give that indication. So information disparities also contribute to individuals who may then engage in inappropriate or even dangerous behavior or might just simply be behind in what the guidelines are for prevention of contracting the disease and spreading the disease. On the next slide, um, the next slide, please. The next slide talks about nutritional disparities. And this again is something that is very well established in the literature uh, that baseline nutritional status Im impacts immune response and does impact the organism's ability to tolerate the overall stress of disease. So when you look at nutritional disparities, it's really shocking in New Orleans, again, that doesn't impact a few people, but a full 87% of New Orleans 175 census tract meet the USDA's definition of a food desert. And that definition means not having a supermarket within one mile. And so while that may not be a problem for patients who have cars, remember I told you that 20% of the families living in New Orleans do not have a car. And for those individuals who are of a lower socioeconomic status, where there may be other issues about cars working, about being able to afford public transportation, having these nutritional disparities is very, very significant. Next. Next slide, please. So overall disparities are very prevalent throughout the United States and particularly in large and high minority urban centers like ours. COVID-19 disparities were expected by all of us who do work in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. They are well entrenched and we knew that they were gonna occur in COVID the way that they occur in other areas that COVID disparities simply mirror the disparities that disadvantaged communities and individuals of color suffer in all illness and injury categories that are monitored by the CDC on an annual basis with the exception of suicide and drug addiction in which whites prevail. So disease disparities have their roots in historic prejudices and injustices that go back 400 years and that characterize the treatment of people of color throughout history. And these are not gonna be remedied without concentrated efforts to ameliorate the root causes. However, I feel like we have done a really good job at UMC and in the city level at trying to address the disparities in the population and to try to make a difference. Dr. W is now going to talk about how the patient experience was tailored to be sensitive to the needs of our population. Well, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, SAM. Uh, I'm Dr. Peter W. I'm the Chief Experience Officer of University Medical Center. My training is both in emergency medicine and pulmonary critical care medicine. Um, I'm gonna speak to you a little bit about our patient experience here at UMC and what we've done uh, to improve that during COVID-19. One of the biggest things that we've done is actually really made an intentional effort within the emergency department at first contact by both the emergency department um, physicians as well as the hospitalist to make sure that we had not just a point of contact for the patients, but a second point of contact um, because we, we noted very quickly that many of these patients deteriorated rapidly and um, lost capacity. And so our ability to contact family members was essential. One of the other groups that helped us navigate a lot of this was also our strong palliative medicine team um, led by uh, Sonia Malhotra, um, who's our, our lead there. <clears throat> One of the other things that we did is we tried to suss out who the medical power of attorney was or who was the medical decision maker for the patient if they could no longer make that decision. 
And we really made a concerted effort to do this in the emergency department. And some of the things that Dr. Mackey did was help build um, some order sets um, that cued and triggered people to ask these questions as well. And then the other things that we talked about um, very clearly within the emergency department, again, were goals of care discussions. And I would tell you that within the past um, three to four weeks, we would have many people aged 50s, 60s, um, who would already be well prepared and comfortable to talk about goals of care. And this wasn't something traditionally that we did frequently in the emergency department, and it's now become more of a standard for us. Um, we think that this is incredibly helpful. We think that it's also healthy to have those discussions and to reduce barriers uh, to have those crucial conversations. The other things that, that we did, we, we created automatic consults to palliative medicine for all ICU admissions. Um, and we felt that this was incredibly helpful, um, not saying that this was necessarily end of life, but we looked at COVID-19 as chronic disease management and palliative medicine's ability to help us navigate that um, with not just the patients, but their family members was, was critically important to the experience we wanted to deliver to our patients. Now, what we did, um, we were intentional about expanding our palliative medicine team and creating a really multidisciplinary team um, that include palliative medicine physicians, physician assistants, social worker dedicated to palliative medicine, as well as folded in our chaplaincy um, residency, our pastoral residency program, as well as the hospital's uh, chaplains, and to include a, a Catholic priest in New Orleans. Um, that was very helpful, as well as having an ICU nurse who was both facile at talking to our ICU teams, as well as to the patients and their family members. And then it also included um, psychiatry residents um, from LSU and Tulane to help facilitate those conversations um, that were crucial conversations and to also assess um, patients' capacity, as well as uh, to effectively communicate to uh, family members. Um, this team met daily to troubleshoot and to really divvy up um, the responsibilities of communicating not just with patients, but more importantly with family members um, because there were a limitation to visitation as you can imagine and many people experience this across the country. But what this team did was intentionally speak to those family members um, to give them updates. And so they divvy that up. And the reason they did this is that palliative medicine actually doubled um, almost overnight their census. So a routine census for them was pretty steep if there were about 30 within our hospital of roughly 380 patients. Um, that's a routine census for them. Um, and in COVID heyday, um, they would see up to 62 patients. Um, and have more than 10 consults in any given day. Um, so it was a robust service um, that continues to be busy, but we're now back down to 30 to 35 patients daily. One of the things that, that we did, and this wasn't um, a debate, this is something that we did very early on, we established visitation guidelines um, for family members. We thought this was critically important for our community um, to, to create and foster trust within our community. And so we set up with palliative medicine and with my department, the ability to have up to three family members um, visit the patient. There would be only a one-time visitation. So um, if the family wanted to see someone before they were taking off of mechanical ventilation, we facilitated that, and that was facilitated with discussions with palliative medicine. And that overall visit um, was limited to 10 minutes. Um, in this past week, um, we've expanded this to include visitations from COVID positive patients who are family members, um, because their family group may have all been infected and we wanted, if it was end of life care, to welcome those people back to the hospital. Their only entrance though was stipulated on, they could not be febrile, they couldn't be symptomatic. So many of those family members who recovered at home 
were then well enough to visit a COVID positive family member in, in the hospital for end of life care visitation. The palliative medicine team also worked with our children's hospital and our, our liaisons there for child life services. So we asked the questions, were there children at home? Um, were there grandchildren at home? Were there nieces and nephews? We have a lot of extended family in New Orleans and we wanted to cater to those needs um, and provide service um, to those individuals who are not just adult, um, but to the children as well. Um, we have a very aggressive use of iPads um, throughout the ICU, as well as to the cohorted COVID unit um, units, um, utilizing iPads so family members could do virtual visits um, with their loved ones. Um, we also used a program called Ease, um, which is designed to use a one-way texting platform that can send texts updates, as well as updates um, with pictures and is just moving into video. It's built for ORs as to, you know, when you go under, when you're out, when the surgery's done, a note from the surgeon, the whole bit. But we used it in our ICU and also used it um, on our floors. And that the, the ratings for satisfaction were, for that were through the roof. Um, great appreciation from the family members uh, on that. And so now I'd like to turn it over to one of our other emergency medicine physicians, Dr. Jennifer Avegno, who's Health Department Director for the City of New Orleans. Jen? Thank you, Peter. And thank you, everyone, for having us here today. It's, it's really a, a privilege to be here. Um, I am one of the LSU emergency medicine physicians, um, practice clinically at UMC, and I'm also the Director of the Health Department for the City of New Orleans. So. COVID, um, when it hit us, hit us pretty quickly. We had done a lot of preparing, as uh, Dr. Elder alluded to, for weeks, really since the China, the first China cases started to come out about how this might look. Based on everything we knew at the time, we really expected it would be a typical pandemic and that it would show up from a traveler and we would be able to quickly isolate and contact trace and, and contain it. Um, what we didn't know, what no one in the U.S. really knew is that it was already spreading. March 9th was our first case in New Orleans. Uh, March 10th, we had two other cases. And New Orleans is a, is a big, small town in that um, everybody sort of knows everybody. And patterns became clear very quickly. None of these three initial cases had any relation to each other, and none of them were travelers. So it was on day two that, from a city perspective, we realized we had community spread and probably very substantial community spread. Because of that, we immediately canceled um, gatherings, large parades that were scheduled for the weekend. Um, and within a week, we had our own stay at home order, which preceded the the uh, states by several days. And you can see by the arrows there that the decisions that we took um, really weren't felt for quite some time. So the decisions that we made in the first week um, still resulted in our peak of cases about three weeks later. And that makes sense with everything that we understand about the virus, that there is likely a 14 to 21 day period of viral shedding. And that simply um, mandating a stay at home order is not an immediate off switch. Uh, it takes time for people to really understand what that means. It takes time to change behaviors and patterns and for schools and businesses to figure out how to shut down. So really from day one to day 29, almost a four week period was our surge. Um, deaths, as you might imagine, are gonna lag that surge. So when we're looking for modeling, when we're looking to understand how this is affecting us as a community, we have to be prepared to look at weeks of data on cases and then to wait a few weeks and see if there is a surge in deaths. So some of the early things we did in addition to the stay at home order, um, have been alluded to, but from a city perspective, what, what makes New Orleans um, somewhat special is that 
we do disasters on a regular basis. We have a lot of muscle memory, we have a lot of institutional knowledge and a lot of pre-existing relationships between state and federal partners, as well as local and community partners, because it's not an infrequent occurrence that we have to mobilize for a disaster, particularly with the threat of hurricanes every year. Um, so the fact that we were able to partner on so many levels and get our convention center, um, you know, field hospital medical monitoring station up and running so quickly is because we had mechanisms already in place. We had preset disaster contracts at the state level for hurricane season that could be activated very quickly that a lot of municipalities didn't have. We had state and federal assets, but we had local experts. And as, as has been said before, those are emergency medicine physicians because this is really our skill set. And just, you know, a little, what that also allows us to do is create facilities that are, you know, cuts above your usual shelter. That's because we have had to run shelters, both medical and general population for previous disasters. So we know that sticking cots um, on a hard surface is not sufficient, particularly in this time of isolation and frail patients who can't be in contact with their loved ones. So um, not only is the setup impressive, but the details are impressive. This is a, a, a patient-centered uh, field hospital. You, you notice that there's um, flowers in the rooms and it, it looks a little bit more homey than what you're used to. Um, and that's because, you know, we recognize, we know what the mental health effects of being in a, in a place like this is, and we want to mitigate those as much as possible. So as Dr. Moreno alluded to, you know, New Orleans really has been a leader in availability of testing. Um, we were the first site chosen to do the federal uh, drive-through testing pilots. That's because when they called us and asked us if we wanted to do this, we said yes, and we already had the pre-existing relationships to get a plan up and running in three days. Um, again, this is a partnership between a variety of different agencies at a number of different levels. And so, you know, it looks like pretty much every other drive-through testing you've ever seen, um, but for us, it got thousands and thousands of tests into our community in a very, very rapid time when other communities were still sort of figuring out, you know, whether or not they should do drive-through testing. But federal assets and programs like this are only as good as the ability that you can put them into a local context. What works for the New Orleans drive-through testing is not gonna work in Los Angeles or in Atlanta. You have to have local folks who know the community to really choose where the locations are, how they're laid out, um, we worked very hard to try and, and um, lower the bar for testing requirements as much as we possible could. We wanted to make sure that the personnel on the ground, even though we had to work with the National Guard and the feds um, and sort of guys in uniforms, that there were enough um, community spaces that people would feel comfortable there. And we fought very, very hard to uh, be granted the opportunity to do callbacks of test results from for our community members. Um, because the way it was set up was that you couldn't call and get your results. You would get a random call from an 1-800 number that wouldn't leave a message and then you couldn't call them back. So we knew we were gonna have thousands of people who were distraught because they, they couldn't get their test results and we didn't want that to fail. Um, so really, you know, the, the takeaway there is that local providers, particularly those of us in emergency medicine who are used to being face-to-face -face with the community all the time, really have to be trusted to run programs like this um, so that they'll be as successful as possible. And even with that, you know, what we, rec what we recognized being on the ground, even though we were able to th serve 13,000 people in three weeks, we knew we were not hitting everyone and we knew we were not hitting folks in the highest need, high, most vulnerable areas um, because there were some barriers. The feds insisted that there was a Louisiana, I, you had to have a Louisiana ID to get tested. So that eliminated people who didn't have an ID as well as our undocumented community. Um, they insisted that you had to have a temperature. You had to have an access to a vehicle. And as Dr. Moreno 
pointed out, that is a, a difficult um, challenge for a large number of our population. And then again, um, in New Orleans, like many other places with long histories of structural racism, there is a significant mistrust of both military and government personnel and the medical establishment. So coming to a sort of sterile place with guys in uniforms and people in strange looking suits is, is gonna be challenging for, for a lot of folks. And just to highlight that, you can sort of see the difference. You know, the left is, is from our drive-through sites and um, it looks like a normal drive-through site, but it might be a little off-putting. On the right is the model that we've developed um, and started running as of last week. So what we found when we mapped all of the addresses of folks that came to the drive-through testing, we noticed that there were these bare spots um, throughout the city where we really were not able to capture residents of that community. And those are the stars that you see. Not surprisingly, these areas correspond with neighborhoods and census tracts that have high rates of poverty, um, high rates of individuals who maybe can't socially distance because they're essential low income workers and limited access to transportation. So the very folks in our community that we really wanted to reach out to and test and um, offer care to the most, we weren't, we were leaving them out in many cases. So we shifted the model um, in partnership with LCMC and LSU to bring testing to the neighborhoods. Um, and this is a fantastic partnership because it merges our technology needs of a drive-through testing, um, the ability to enter records and be able to keep track of test results, the medical personnel for both the oversight, the collection, the lab, and then the additional resources and wraparound services that we at the health department feel are crucial. This is a time in which many of our traditional programs are not able to access their constituents um, because we just can't find them or everyone is at home. And we know that there are people out there out of work um, without connection to behavioral health services, domestic violence services, our women, uh, infants and children, the WIC program, um, food resources, but we don't really have a way to test them. So or to, to reach them, excuse me. So what we've done is not only have we brought or are we bringing the testing to neighborhoods that have been under tested with the highest needs, but you're not just coming to get a test and leaving, you're getting a needs assessment while you're waiting in line. And then whatever you screen on that needs assessment, um, we're able to give you something, whether it's just a resource sheet, um, whether it's a referral, whether it's um, our pharmacy uh, school on site who's walking you through how to get your medications now that your pharmacy might not be open or delivering. Um, and so people are able to get more than they came for. Uh, we do this because through this partnership, uh, we, we are building community trust because we do not want anybody to be left behind in this particular disaster. We, what's important to us about this next phase of testing, which we really hope will be a model, is that we want to give you multiple ways to access. So if you don't have a car, you can walk, you can bike. We even had folks show up on scooters. We don't really care how you get there. We're trying to position these around public transportation hubs so it's easier for folks to take the bus. Um, there's no ID, no insurance requirement. And again, we're doing the on-site needs assessment. And then we're continuing to use our local professionals for callbacks. Um, the folks that we have been calling back who are positive, the vast majority of them are asymptomatic, out and about in the community and unprepared for what we're telling them. So it really does take a kind patient voice on the other end of the line to say, no, you actually do need to come home from the grocery store right now. Let me explain to you what the consequences of that are. You don't get that with a big call center, you know, somewhere in another state. And so that's really, you know, from being on the front lines in the emergency department, and this is the other front lines, right? Um, this is the front lines of the community, but it's the same lessons. It's the ability to leverage existing relationships and institutional knowledge, to be flexible, and to always be patient or resident-centered. Um, so thank you, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Mackey. Thanks, Dr. Abagno. 
I'm the Chief Medical Informatics Officer for University Medical Center, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the EMR and the IT involvement in this. Um, I'm also a practicing emergency medicine physician. <clears throat> um, so COVID and technology, this is what I would call the first true IT emergency that I've ever seen and hopefully will ever see again. Um, a totally novel disease. There's no existing orders, diagnoses, ICD-10 codes, labs, really anything built in the system. Um, it was a system emergency. It hit all of our hospitals at basically the same time. And like they alluded to, we have five hospitals. And then on top of that, we actually had a lot of good technology solutions available to um, help with treatment of the disease as well as decrease our PPE use. Um, so the first major emphasis that we had was on telemedicine. So getting all of our providers, our doctors, nurses set up with telemedicine. Um, we actually installed telemedicine in all of our EDs, inpatient and ICU at every hospital. So our doctors didn't have to see patients and burn PPE. PPE burn was a very big concern for our hospital system early on. Um, we were reusing masks, um, reusing a lot of things that were single use items and we were able to mitigate a lot of this by using telemedicine. So a patient in the ED would actually get seen by their physician over an iPad, um, which actually turned out to be a little better in some cases because you didn't have, you could actually see the patient's face. You didn't have to don and doff everything. So it decreased the number of PPEs that we use. It also decreased the number of exposures to our doctors, nurses, and patients. Um, we were relatively limited. LCMC as a system had only 500-ish telemedicine visits in the month of February. Um, April to date, we've had roughly 28,000 telemedicine visits. And I think this is a really important part of keeping the community trust. And that's the theme of this is keeping our patients getting seen. Um, it's surprising 85, 90 year old patients are willing to see their doctor over um, Zoom or iPhone or iPad. Um, and also the regulations changing really helped a lot with how we quickly we could install all of this. Um, talked about the setting up in the ED. And then we are still continuing to do telemedicine um, across the system and across all encounter types. Um, a lot of that has transitioned over to actual patients talking to their families. Um, we've used a lot of the iPads and Zoom to do telemedicine, but also to connect patients with their families and have um, either end of life discussions or planning discussions over uh, telemedicine. Um, another key part that we did, and they've shown some of the models, so we were able to do some actual local LCMC, so system-specific modeling for ICU capacity and inpatient capacity. Um, as early on in this disease, especially in New Orleans and Louisiana, we were very concerned that we were going to run out of hospital beds and ICU beds. We were predicted to completely run out of hospital beds in the state by April 8th. Um, so this data that you're seeing right here is our real-time ICU COVID patients. Um, we started tracking, obviously, day one. But we couldn't do any modeling until um, about a week into it when we had some real data. So the bottom line is ICU patients um, trended over time. Next slide. Um, here's another example of a model that we put out. Um, I like this model a lot because if you follow hurricanes and do any hurricane tracking, this looks a lot like a hurricane. And since we're in New Orleans, that's a pretty apt comparison for about how it hit the city. Um, but you could see from this that we were able to track our true ICU bed usage, so following the blue line, but we also had predicted highs and lows by date. Um, so we were expected to see about 120 ICU COVID patients by March 30th, which we actually did. Do the next one. We were also accurately able to predict the peak um, a lot earlier than was expected. So New Orleans actually did very good at flattening the curve. We were expected to peak about April 7th or 8th. Um, and at that point, we were going to be at our very top limit for system resources as a city and a state. Um, we ended up peaking about the 30th or 31st of March, um, depending on which data you look at. But we were able to predict that days to a week ahead of a lot of other systems with capacity modeling. And then here is a look at all of our different capacity modelings um, that we were publishing at the time and how good they did and how accurate they were. So the orange line is capacity modeling 
um, the, the true capacity and the other lines are what our modeling was able to show and predict um, on a day by day basis. So next slide. So something I wanted to highlight, um, one thing we were able to find because again, from an IT side, we were so busy building data um, or data mining. We were building reports and looking at things. We quickly noticed that for um, some reason, University Medical Center was actually doing a little bit better than the national and international reported data. We were extubating on average about 40% of our COVID patients and most reported data up to that time was most places we're exhibiting about 10%. Um, we, we noticed that pretty quickly from all of our modeling and our flattening of the curve a little earlier than expected, but this is a very busy slide and I know that and should be available later, but this is actually UMC's COVID critical care guidelines. So they had a very specific process that they were um, going down the road once you were either pre-intubation or during intubation and we were able to get this information out pretty quickly and um, hopefully helped a lot of people because as this, these guidelines were implemented at other facilities, we were actually able to see decreases in mortality over time. Um, so the testing was a bit of a nightmare um, as several of the other people alluded to. When we first started, we didn't have a single test and then by early March, we had a single Office of Public Health test that was not interfaced with the system. It was basically sent back to us as a fax. And obviously with these patients, you don't wanna miss anyone. Um, so getting those put into the EMR as well as getting the correct follow-up to put in with these fax labs. And then early March, about a week or two later, we had some third party labs that came on board, our um, commercial labs, and those were not entirely very helpful because of the delay and lag, but we also didn't have interfaces built for these, so we had the same problem with those paper results coming back. Um, and go back one second. Uh, and then the in-hospital labs came on board and those were interfaced and kind of ready to go. Once we got there on about April 10th, things got a lot better. One other thing to note, and um, this happens to people, it happens to healthcare systems, there were a lot of scam, scam type lab tests out there um, across the country. I think this was happening. Various pop-up labs would show up offering COVID labs that weren't FDA approved, that aren't, weren't um, anything that our hospital system could use, but navigating that minefield was an interesting time. Um, and then contact tracing was also a big part of that. Um, with patient care, and that's kind of the focus of this, is how do you get the correct information to patients as it's coming out? And this patient care information was changing on a daily basis. When COVID first started, it was different almost every day of who could get tested, why they could get tested, what to do if you had COVID, whether you were self-quarantining or self-isolating, and really getting that information into the system and actually out to the patients was quite a challenge. Um, along with following up on COVID patients, um, just making sure that we had adequate follow up. A lot of our patients don't have phones, they don't have a way to get communication. So, making sure that we had a way to get a hold of them to follow up and to make sure that they were getting better and we didn't know what the disease process was at the time. We also had to actively be translating our discharge instructions into mostly Spanish, Vietnamese, and French. Those were our big three, but almost every day we were translating something to a different language um, and it was a totally new operation because most of the time this takes a month or two to do and we were doing it in 12 to 24 hours. And I'm going to give it back to Dr. Moreno. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the participation of everybody from my University Medical Center Emergency Department, of which I'm very proud. Um, we really did a great response to the needs of this very special city by repurposing emergency department areas and changing staffing to meet the workflow and the census as they change with the pandemic. We were able to allocate PPE to the areas and hospitals where it was needed because of the fact that we used a system-wide approach. We also used unconventional locations to cope with conventional problems, such as using the convention center for patients who were not able to quarantine at home. We increased testing, especially in the under-resourced areas and had one of the highest testing rates in the world. Despite that, 
we still experience significant disparities in outcomes, particularly among the African American population. And while that is not dissimilar to the rest of the United States, it was indeed disturbing for us. At UMC, we partnered with hospitalists and increased the participation of palliative care and spiritual care in with COVID care. The nursing staff was able to use Zoom to ensure that patients remained in communication and our psychiatry attendings and residents assisted patients and their families and assisted staff in managing the psychological stressors that were, opposed, uh, were imposed upon us by the unique characteristics of this disease. We allowed a one-time three-person family visit for all of the patients and are now even allowing asymptomatic COVID family members to attend, especially for end of life visits. Our child life department from our sister hospital is very involved for families that have children. We made a point of shutting down the city early and this did make a difference, but currently deaths are tracking two weeks post-diagnosis, which is making it hard to convince patients to still stay at home. Our hurricane planning process provided a foundation for our COVID response. We drew on relationships that were established post Katrina to set up the response for COVID. For example, we were able to facilitate drive-through testing and community-based testing because of the relationships that we had established in the past. COVID presented us with the first time ever IT emergency. Nothing was in place no test orders, no result retrieval, no ICD-10 codes, but technology offered us a lot of solutions, including telemedicine, needs projection through modeling, and discharge instructions in multiple languages, which virtually change daily due to the constantly changing guidelines. So overall, UMC has really done a great job with a challenging disease in a wonderful, but under-resourced and financially disadvantaged cities. So thank you so much for being present with us tonight to talk about that, to learn from our experiences. And thank you to SAEM for giving us the privilege of sharing the great work that we are doing at LCMC. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moreno, and thank you again to all our speakers for this timely and informative presentation tonight. So in a few moments, we will answer questions from the audience. And as a reminder, for those who are attending the live session, please send your questions in via the Q&A button in your Zoom menu interface. We will try to get to as many questions as is possible, and we won't go past the top of the hour. So while the questions continue to come in, I'd like to direct the first question to Dr. W. So how did your experience with caring for patients after Hurricane Katrina prepare you for this pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question, Dr. Martin. But I, I, would, I would say that it's very similar in some regards and different in others. And the way that it's similar is the, the same population is disproportionately affected, right? Um, social determinants of health weren't cured with Katrina. Um, if anything, many of those things were exacerbated, but we're a little bit smarter about it. Um, the same diseases concern us, again, whether it's diabetes, hypertension, or obesity, um, those things predispose our patient populations for poor outcomes. Um, the national exposure that we've gotten is kind of similar. Um, I would also say the, the mindset is similar as well, because uh, although there's a lot of adrenaline for Katrina and a big crash and, you know, that adrenaline drives you for about two to three weeks, same thing for COVID, but the mentality is a mentality of being in a marathon and knowing that this is, is, is in a sprint, but it's a marathon. It's going to take some time. COVID's not going to go away in the next couple of months. It's going to be with us for over a year. Um, I think the other issue that's the same is that there's concern and the concern is not just for health outcome, but the economic outcome of our city and uh, those people who work in restaurants and work in hotels and are dependent upon um, you know, visitors to our city. That's, that's similar as well. Things that are a little bit different. Wow. Um, you know, before when Katrina hit, we were in uh, 
dilapidated building. We loved it dearly, but it was dilapidated and under-resourced. We're now in a state-of-the-art billion-dollar facility, um, and it's pretty tremendous. Um, the other thing is that manpower was an issue during Katrina. We utilized manpower here with two medical schools that are, have robust, brilliant people that contributed. Um, and again, you know, I, I think none of our population has been shielded from this, whereas in Katrina, um, you know, those people that had the means typically left. And then I, I would just tell you that the people who spoke tonight are people who grew up in um, a Katrina diaspora. And by that, I mean, um, they may not have been functioning physicians at Katrina, but they sure were functioning physicians and trainees at a time when we were still caring for people in tents, still caring for people in a department store, and still caring for people in a hospital that shouldn't have been a makeshift hospital before we came in, into this hospital in August 2015. And so those, those people are our leaders, not just in emergency medicine, but in our community, whether it's the city or whether it's the state. Um, but it, it just tells you that we were made for this. Um, and there's no doubt it, about that, but we were absolutely trained and, and honed in disaster. And, and this was self-evident in our response to COVID-19. Great, great response, uh, Dr. W. I appreciate it. Okay, so now let's take some questions from the audience. And the first, I think, is apropos given the fact that we are talking about New Orleans. So this question, and I will share who it's from when I know, um, is, uh-oh, we switched it up. But I switched my, my order up in here. But the question is, and I would love to hear the thought from as many panelists as is possible. So what should Mardi Gras 2021 look like? <laughs> so I think, you know, everybody wants us to jump on that grenade, right? Mardi Gras was a very popular punching bag, except it turns out that, um, you know, nobody knew that this was and Times Square on a good day is Mardi Gras every day. Um, but, you know, it's really not about the date, it's about the data. And so, you know, while we all understand that reopening has to be phased and slow and based on a foundation of public health first and safety, um, we, can't, we really don't know what's gonna happen in the next couple of months. We don't know if a vaccine is going to be available or not available. We don't know when we're gonna reach herd immunity. Um, and so I think it's really understanding um, the long-term challenges. And as Dr. W said, we really are in this for the long haul, uh, but that nothing that we have predicted about this virus in the last two months has been straightforward. So we shouldn't expect it to all of a sudden follow a straightforward trajectory from now. Excellent. Others from the panel? You know, I'm a, I'm a native New Orleanian. I'm not going to touch that one um, with the 10th <laughs> pole. <laughs> so I wish we had a good answer for this. Um, our modeling is at best out a few weeks at anything that you look at because we just don't know the future of this disease process. Um, I mean, right now, I don't know what to tell you that we're gonna be doing in six weeks, much less Mardi Gras in February. I mean, we're gonna find a way to celebrate because we're New Orleanians, but there's no way to predict that at the moment. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, our, our community, you know, in the past eight weeks has changed completely. Um, in how we go about our daily lives. And so I think, um, you know, looking at this, uh, you know, months from now is just something we can't do. Very good. So I know uh, most of the discussion so far is focused around public health as well as operational things. And so the next question is, what impact, if any, has um, the response to this pandemic had on your education mission and your research mission? I guess I'll let you, Dr. Moreno, start off. I know you're a director for the research uh, at LSU Emergency Medicine. 
So the impact on the education, um, I'll start with that. The impact on the education, I think, has been really significant. Um, I am teaching the courses that I usually teach on Zoom. And so the students are getting the content, but the students, I don't think, are getting the same level of interaction that, that they get um, when we're in the classroom. Um, I think it's pretty close. I will say that. I think Zoom is pretty darn good. But I, again, you don't necessarily have all of the nuances that are present in a room when people are present in a room. I think that students not being able to be in the hospital and to be interacting with patients, while I understand from a safety standpoint that was the right decision to make, um, they are missing out on a once in a lifetime um, experience and they're missing out on a lot of education that could come from treating these patients. I, um, I was in medical school during the AIDS epidemic in New York and I, I really feel like that was an incredibly rich learning experience. Um, that was a time when HIV, uh, there were no medications to treat it and people were dying and people were dying a lot. Um, understandably, the transmission is different. And so it was not that kind of a risk for medical students to be involved. But I think that that, that is something that students are missing. Um, on the other hand, the idea of putting students into those environments when their technical skills are definitely not developed and they would be at higher risk of contracting um, a disease. It is, it is wise from that standpoint to keep them out. Um, from a research standpoint, I think this is one of the most exciting times that we have ever, ever encountered. In my research role, I am on multiple, multiple meetings a day with people from all over the world, China, Italy, Spain, all over the United States, South America, Mexico. The discussions are amazing. It's amazing to watch how all of us are coming to the same conclusions when, you know, three weeks ago, we were all talking about the fact that people were not being hypercapnic and they were able to tolerate such incredibly high levels of hypoxia or low levels of oxygen saturation. The fact that patients' lungs remain so highly compliant until they had been put on the vent and with high levels of PEEP, we all came to these conclusions at the same time. And so it was amazing to see, you know, how different experiences were or, or experiences in different countries were so similar and we were all coming to the same conclusions. And to see that collaboration among physician scientists, I think is also very exciting. I still think we don't know enough about this disease. I still think that there is a rich field to mine in terms of research. Even one of the questions that I got, um, one of the written questions from Chris Carpenter was about the fact that are some of these comorbidities maybe surrogates for underlying things like poor nutrition, poor immune status? You know, we haven't had a chance to look at any of that. The fact that we're getting multiple, this was another, uh, another thing that I got from Siavash Sarwati, uh, my former resident. What's happening to all of these patients who used to be having coming to the hospital with MIs? Well, again, Dr. Elder and Dr. Lim, another colleague of ours, and I are gonna be looking at all those DNR calls that we've been getting from EMS. What were people dying from? Were they dying from COVID that they didn't know they had maybe? Or were they dying because they were afraid to come into the hospital? So there, there is just this incredible field for us to do research. So I would say number one, COVID has opened up amazing opportunities for research. Number two, COVID is showing us that there are amazing opportunities for collaboration. And number three, we are reconnecting with the old definition of physician scientists that it doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what your politics is. It doesn't matter where you live. We all need to work together to find the answers so that when this disease resurges again, we'll be prepared better. So in follow-up, Dr. Moreno, are your residents involved in the care of COVID patients and have you hibernated your clinical research? 
Oh, so yes, the residents are definitely involved in the clinical care of COVID patients. And no, we are not hibernating our clinical research. We are not. It's more challenging because we cannot have um, people, we can't have students in the ED collecting data. We can't have residents in the ED more than they need to be. So we're not asking them to go and collect data in the emergency department, but we are still putting things through the IRB and we are still working hard on, um, although it's going slower, but we're working hard, hard on getting some of the answers. Thank you. Uh, so let's switch up here. here. Here's a question from Dr. Lisa Hayes. The, and this is to Dr. Elder. The incident command structure can make it a challenge to communicate with all faculty, staff, and learners. What methods have you used to build and maintain lines of communication within your department? Yeah, I think communications are difficult, whether it's incident and command or not. Um, and that's probably one of the, the key ingredients to really you know, be successful throughout this whole process. And so we, we, we uh, evaluated and changed and morphed throughout the, the entire time we've dealt with this. And so we've gone from, you know, emails to uh, kind of virtual meetings via uh, calls or Zoom type platforms to um, having some in-person uh, events at the hospital with bringing some people together, although we have to be careful with social distancing there. Um, and we've even utilized um, Kind of a running uh, a document that we've put into our into epic and so that's available when you're working as a clinician on a shift or in the hospital you can pull it up uh, as an epic resource and so we've kind of used all of that uh, at different times and in different ways throughout the entire process and some of it's worked and some of it hasn't we've kind of tweaked as we've gone along okay any others want to add to that if not, uh, this question is for you, Dr. W. Uh, you mentioned that the family uh, visitation of up to three visitors per patient for 10 minutes, was this only for patients who were at end of life? Um, it, it, the focus for the visitation is for patients at end of life. Um, and some of them were, it, it's kind of difficult um, because some of the patients who said they were you know, on the mechanical ventilator. And then we got information that they didn't want to be on the mechanical ventilator. So the family was able to visit them just prior to extubating the patient because clinically they could be extubated um, with a plan of not reintubating them. Um, so it wasn't really end of life. It was just critical care. Um, but because it's only one shot, we're not having multiple visits. Um, typically was surrounding end of life care. Okay. Uh, so this is open to the entire panel and I'd love to hear a few different perspectives, but uh, as we are all looking to uh, move back to semi-normal uh, clump operations and then a uh, time where COVID-19 is probably just gonna be another disease we have to contend with, how are you triaging trauma patients who have are severely injured and may not be able to provide a reliable history, are you presuming that these patients are COVID positive? So let me, let me just start on that one just for a second. Our first COVID patient was a found down patient. It was not a COVID complaint. It was a found down patient. And the patient made their way from our ED at change of shift, right? The, the nightmare time. Um, and then made their way up to the ICU at change of shift until we isolated that patient. So we had a, about 150 exposures to that patient in a eight hour period of time. It's pretty frightening. Okay. Um, so I think we've all heard much in the media about obviously the physical toll that um, COVID-19 has taken on both our patients but also on uh, physicians, nurses, and otherwise. But I think we're all growing to um, have an appreciation for the psychological toll as well. So this question comes from Martina Caldwell, and it's, it's for you again, Dr. W, giving your role as a chief experience officer. What resources exist in New Orleans, and because of your familiarity with disasters, unfortunately, to treat healthcare providers and communities uh, after a traumatic event like this? You know, that's a great question. We just spent um, 
yesterday categorizing all the things that we're doing here. So first and foremost, our community has supported us in an unparalleled fashion. It has just been tremendous, um, both with food. We were getting notes from across the country, um, you know, sidewalk chalk painted, um, amazing gifts of PPE, um, handmade masks that we really can't use in the hospital, but we give to family members, a whole host of things like that. Um, one of our psychiatry residents is doing a virtual yoga um, for de-stressing. Our trauma psychologists in partnership with LSU Psychiatry is offering virtual first aid um, and psychological first aid um, seven days a week. Um, and for those people who want one-on-one, -on -one, they can do that, or it can be virtual first aid as a group. We're offering that to residency programs and just a major shout out to the, how progressive our EM program is. They schedule it into their routine conferences. And so they, they've done this wellness pursuit for some time now, um, again, championing the spirit of charity, which is just phenomenal. Um, we have our pastoral residency who makes rounds, not just on the patients, but also on the staff. Um, and make that available. We have set aside one of our conference rooms just as a respite room um, and typically plays nice calming music. But um, last weekend and this weekend, it will um, feature Jazz Fest music um, to honor you know, the loss or our mourning of Jazz Fest, which was to be hosted last weekend and then this weekend, which again is part of our culture. Um, so it's it's been broad. The, the fear though that I have is that we're still in a high adrenaline phase of this and people don't know, um, you know what they'll be mourning a month from now. And you know, Jay Kaplan works with us as well and he helps us um, through this as well. One of the things that he, his analogy is, you know, we're creating potholes um, and we're gonna be stepping into those potholes and driving through those potholes over the next year and not realizing why we're suddenly in a funk or why we're uh, suddenly um, distraught. And then we have to be about our own self-care, but not just self, we have to look to each other and see how we can help each other um, because even losing one of our colleagues is, is too, one too many. Thank you, Peter, and um, the organization is obviously very lucky to have you uh, helping to guide them um, through this difficult time. Uh, so the next question is for you, Dr. Vagno, and uh, this is, uh, I don't know who this is from, but the question is as follows. Have you seen any patients that have been detained by ICE that have been brought uh, to the emergency department for evaluation of COVID or with COVID-related symptoms? So I'll tell you, um, you know, from a city perspective, this, this hit our radar pretty early. And what we're being told from ICE and from the feds is that they have suspended any detention other than a violent um, felon. Um, I, we have not, I have not personally, nor have I heard stories of that being untrue. Um, however, we know that whether or not it's true, that fear is incredibly real. And our undocumented community has not been coming to the testing sites to access healthcare, to the emergency departments in the numbers that we are used to seeing. And that's very concerning because in many cases, these are essential workers living in congregate settings who um, would, you know, are, are ripe to spread the disease and have a really tragic you know, clusters. So that's one of the things we're doing with the mobile testing is we found um, partners in the community and a local church that has a long tradition of being a safe haven for the undocumented community. And our mobile testing site at the beginning of next week is in partnership with them at their location so that we, we have the best chance of getting the community to, to trust and come out and let us just assess their needs, um, test them and figure out what we need to do for them. Fantastic, thank you. So there are a few questions that have come in around um, telehealth. So I'm gonna direct this next one to you, Dr. Mackey. And our first national grand rounds out of New York, uh, telehealth um, was a very prominent part of the response of the Columbia and Cornell 
uh, colleagues um, in, in meeting the challenge of this pandemic. So uh, there are a few questions here that wanna hear a little bit more about how exactly you've integrated uh, telehealth into your response. Yeah, so um, telehealth is now here to stay. I, I think the Band-Aid has been ripped off and I don't think the regulations are going away um, anytime soon. We can we imagine this is at least until the end of the year, but they're not gonna just change the regulations after that. Um, so our response, really the, the first stage was getting inpatient and ED patients seen via telehealth. And then the second stage was getting all of our um, ambulatory clinics set up to do telehealth. And we kind of like everything that went on with this process, we just didn't care about all the red tape and just did it. Um, we didn't actually integrate telehealth with Epic. Um, Epic is our EMR, it doesn't matter, it works the same on anyway. We just set up basically physicians with iPads using Zoom and ways for them to get appointments through their normal routes. Um, so future state is going to be actually integrating all of this and making it much more official. But as you saw from our numbers, going from 500 telehealth visits to almost 30,000 in a month, um, the new normal that we're going to be at as physicians, um, whether emergency physicians, we couldn't even do telehealth in the emergency department until the beginning of April when they relaxed red regulations. Um, that's going to add a whole new bit of information because now we can see any state, any patient in the state of Louisiana, you know, we're not low, we're not geographically constrained like we are with our normal emergency medicine. Um, so there's a lot to come with that. And we're, we're just in the beginning stages, really. Have you incorporated remote monitoring into your telehealth efforts? If so, if you could tell us a little bit about that. So we're still in that process. Um, I think we just got our first shipment of remote monitoring in for pulse ox. That's probably the main one that we need for COVID patients. Um, that's still kind of in the, the preliminary phases, just because that's, that's a significant learning curve, as well as a, um, you, if you don't have internet, you can't use those devices. And a lot of our patients don't have a reliable internet connection. Um, so we're actually looking at ways that we can give patients internet connections so they can utilize these various devices. Um, but that's definitely coming and should be in place in the next week or two, I think. Thank you. Uh, so the next question comes to Dr. Barron from Jeff Baker, and it says, Dave Bar uh, Barron mentioned dispo disposition to homeless shelters. Was this a site designated by the city or were there multiple sh shelters? What sort of numbers were discharged to a homeless shelter? So it was run by the state and initially there were 12. It's a, it's a national park that's got 12 cabins in it initially. And those were, that was the initial um, location for the homeless patients. And then the state brought in some additional trailers on top of that. And I, I think that the, the maximum I heard was 363 spots. I don't know, Dr. Begno, if you can comment on that. Um, it was never completely full. And that number is back down to 90 spots between these cabins and the, and the trailers. Uh, but it was run by the state. Right. It's a, um, it's a state park. Actually, it's quite a lovely state park. Um, and the state, we're, the city is some assistance where needed, but the state is there just really for, for monitoring. There's not much medical care that goes on. These are healthy patients that don't need to be hospitalized, but also to provide some wraparound services because this is a very challenging population. Dr. Barron, while I have you on the hook, I'm gonna ask you to bring out your crystal ball. Uh, your center sounds like many other centers around the country with a few exceptions where you've seen markedly depressed um, uh, clinical volume uh, in your emergency department. So when you look out in the next few weeks, months, even years, what do you see? So even in the last week, we started to see a couple, a little bit of an increase in our volume. So we were seeing 140s. In the last couple of days, we started to see 180s, and there's a plan in terms of patients per day coming through, and um, there's a plan to lift some of these um, isolation orders on May 15th. And so if you look, look at that initial graph that I showed where it just kind of dropped off as soon as we started forced isolation as a state, I anticipate that as pieces of the isolation um, stop, uh, we'll start to see a slow influx of patients, but I don't think it's gonna start being um, anything appreciable until at least the, the 15th of May. And then for months after that, I think until it comes back up to normal. 
thank you. And, and so so many others uh, on the panel would love to hear what your thoughts are about what, what we should expect um, in terms of our clinical volumes over the next few weeks and months. I think a lot of it's going to depend on how we actually open back up and we have to be really smart in how we do that. If we just, you know, open up and people go back to acting like, you know, we did, you know, two, three months ago, I think we're going to see a significant increase in COVID cases and we'll see more patients. And I think if people can be patient with uh, public health and governmental leaders as we slowly start to open up based on testing and real models and scientific data, then I think we can keep those numbers down and then we'll kind of slowly go back to what's going to be our new normal uh, and we won't see that big push into the hospitals again. Yeah, I think it's going to be a, a sort of a dancing helix or a ribbon, two ribbons between COVID and non-COVID. You know, you can only defer medical care so long and given the, the likelihood of a prolonged economic shutdown, the health uh, effects of those are enormous. You know, the cancers that we haven't diagnosed in the emergency department this past two months are gonna show up next month in a much advanced state or the silent MI that then is gonna be florid heart failure in a month or two are gonna compete with those sort of ebbs and flows of COVID patients. So I don't have any doubt we're going to get back to, to full volume, but finding the balance of, you know, the isolation and PPE needs of the COVID patients with just sort of our regular deferred maintenance patients is, is going to be challenging for every emergency department. Yeah, I, I'm concerned about our patient population in particular, because these are the people who already you know, suffer from poor outcomes for all types of cancers, poor outcomes for heart disease, um, for stroke. Uh, and now we're giving them even more reason to put off a clinic appointment or create another barrier so they can't get their prescription filled. And so I have great concerns over that um, and how we can message that. I mean, the hospital itself, one of the first things that we did was a, a call-in number for prescription refills just to facilitate that. Um, but you know, it's still a barrier to get into a clinic uh, unless you have a very you know, urgent or emergent complaint. So one of the things that I noticed um, when I first came to work with this team, um, which was after Katrina, was the period of time, which seemed to span up to five years, that we saw patients coming into the emergency department and saying exactly what, what both Peter and Jen have alluded to, I haven't been to the clinic in X number of years. I haven't been able to get my medication filled in X number of years. And these patients were coming in with extreme variants of their disease. So severe congestive heart failure came in because they could just couldn't breathe anymore. Patients who were in ketoacidosis because they just hadn't taken their medication for so long. So I have serious concerns about this too. And I think if you look at what happened after Katrina, um, we can definitely expect that this could happen again. One of the things though that may make a big difference, um, which Scott had a huge role in, is setting up the telemedicine system. A lot of the patients who come to the emergency department, as Peter said, come because they can't get into the clinic and can't get their prescriptions refilled. This is something we're able to do now without seeing them directly. Um, patients who are using the telemedicine to ask, do I actually need to come in? Here are the symptoms that I'm having. It is gonna be possible for us to even prescribe um, for patients with telemedicine once we get it up and running to the level that we want it to run. I think we have a huge opportunity here to change the face of emergency medicine as a nation, not just for New Orleans, but as a nation. And I think that this is gonna be one of the things that we um, who are leaders in emergency medicine associations need to take up as a lobbying issue because we need to be appropriately reimbursed for being able to give this kind of care so that we can continue to support the systems that will give this kind of care. And you talk about increased access for patients who don't have a car, who can't afford car fare to come to the hospital. This is gonna make a tremendous difference. And I think this can be an incredible force for good because of the things that people like Scott are doing to get this system to work. Well stated, Dr. Moreno. 
Uh, so the switching gears a little bit. So this question is for Dr. Avegno, and I think Dr. W, you'd be a great person to chime in as well. So this is from Dr. Chris Carpenter. Hospitals across the country have created no visitor policies for suspected COVID patients without exceptions. These policies are particularly detrimental for older adults with dementia who rely upon familiar caregivers to reduce the incident of delirium when hospitalized. So how did New Orleans convince infection control or, or at your specific institution convince infection control to relax these restrictions? Peter, that's all you. Okay. Um, I, I would just say because of my role and because of my history with the hospital, and because of my affiliation um, and connections with infection prevention and control um, and palliative medicine, this is something that we made a priority. It was intentional. This wasn't, oh, we think it might be a good idea. Um, and so it was, you know, we, we were pretty adamant that this had to happen, um, that we had to cater to our patients. It, it, this choice, is an incredibly selfish choice. And I would just tell you, this is what makes it selfish, is that hearing my colleagues across the country who don't have this kind of policy and hearing them talk about the isolation of their patients and their patients who are dying by themselves without their loved ones surrounding them is debilitating. It, it's, this is all tough enough for all of us I can't imagine doing this and not having the ability to at least have three family members in. Fantastic. Great advocacy there, uh, Dr. W. I appreciate that. Um, so switching gears, this question is a testing related question. We've had a few of those. This is where Dr. Elder comes from, Dan Milnicki. What's your COVID-19 testing capacity, particularly at your community-based sites? Uh, where do your test kits come from? and who are performing these tests? Sure, so we, we have three different um, platforms that we're utilizing currently in our system. We have the Abbott test, which you've heard a lot about in the news. We have the Cepheid uh, system, which for a lot of people, they use it for their uh, flu swabs routinely. Um, and we also have the roche Cobas uh, analyzer, which is one of the big, large machines in the lab. The, the Roche machine can do um, several hundred a day. And so that's the platform we're using for those community testing sites. So we're doing about 250 tests a day. Um, there's really kind of two pieces to that. It's the collection kits and the availability of collection kits, which we all know has been a problem. Um, and so we, we've kind of limited it there for both the collection kit need and the ability to run uh, the community test as well as hospital uh, or health system uh, testing that's performed in our clinics or in our hospitals. And so that kind of gives us uh, the capacity to run, you know, several hundred a day um, uh, continuously on, on the Roche uh, analyzer. Are you uh, doing any antibody uh, tests at this point? And if so, how are you using them? Yeah, so we're currently um, uh, validating some of our uh, antibody testing on a different uh, platform. Uh, we are uh, in, in talks right now of how we're going to utilize that. Um, you know, there is a lot of... Um, uh, controversy right now about antibody testing. Uh, we really don't know what the antibodies mean. So does it confer immunity? We don't know. How long will the antibodies be there? We don't know. And so there's not a whole lot that we can tell the individual uh, with that antibody testing other than, yes, you were likely exposed and have antibodies uh, to this coronavirus. Um, however, I do think there are some other opportunities kind of on a population level, um, whether it's healthcare providers or in the community, uh, with some of that uh, antibody testing uh, uh, results. And so we're, we're currently working that out uh, in our system. Thank you, Dr. Elder. So I think we just have time for maybe one or two additional questions before we conclude. Uh, so th this question I'll first direct to you, Dr. Uh, Moreno, and, but I would love to hear thoughts from others on the panel. What can we do to reassure people of color who are concerned that they may have or be at risk for COVID-19 and who happen to have other comorbidities? What can we do to reassure people? Um, I think that certainly being a person of color, um, having comorbidities and seeing what's shown on the news is pretty terrifying. 
Um, and you know, one of the things that we've shown through the years, those of us who do work in, in this area have shown that access is not necessarily a factor. Um, that was actually shown by the Institute of Medicine in 2003. And we've also shown that education um, does not play a role. And socioeconomic status does not pay, play a role. So if you or I, Dr. Martin, um, get cancer, get COVID, get hypertension, whatever we get, we are gonna have worse outcomes than our counterparts who are Caucasian. So the reassurance I think comes not so much in being able to say, oh, don't pay attention to the facts, but the reassurance comes from the team that's taking care of you. And this is one of the reasons that I'm working where I'm working because our community has tremendous faith in us. And even though we are in a different building and, and that is a beautiful building, and even though it's not called charity anymore, part of the reason that people like Dr. W and Dr. Avegno and people who have been around in that system a lot longer than I have continue to call it the spirit of charity is that our community knows that we love them. Our community knows that they are gonna get the best care that can be given to anybody, regardless of what it costs. They also know that we're gonna do the right thing for them, no matter what kind of insurance or no insurance they have. And I think that is the key thing. Even though we're emergency physicians and we don't have ongoing relationships with individual patients, we have our faces out there in the community. And our patients have com comfort and confidence when they deal with us. And they tell us when they come, I wouldn't go anywhere else. I don't want to go anywhere else. I was born in Charity Hospital. I gave birth to my kids in Charity Hospital. I'm coming to Charity Hospital. And I think the reassurance is built on a decades and decades long relationship with the community. Well, I think we should uh, probably leave the questions at that with such a great response. Um, I, I want to thank Dr. Moreno and the uh, rest of tonight's speakers for sharing your incredible stories for helping the rest of the country cope just a little bit better with the COVID-19 pandemic at their own hospitals. To the audience, thank you for joining us again. Stay safe and good night. Thank you.